Welcome to Voices from the Bench, a dental laboratory podcast. Send us an email at info at voicesfromthebench.com or look for us on Facebook at Voices from the Bench. Greetings and welcome to episode number 48 of Voices from the Bench. My name is Elvis. My name is Barbara. Oh, we're not saying last names anymore. That's new. That's always good. We're going to switch it up every now and again. Okay. Cal Lab and LMT Lab Day Chicago is over. Mm. Sadly, you'll have to wait another week to hear about it because with the magic of podcasting, it allows us to record this episode before Lab Day weekend, so we don't have to spend the whole time editing this episode, and we can focus on recording all the great people who are at LMT Lab Day Chicago. I think it'd be a little more fair to say that you don't have to focus on editing because you're the editing guru, so we'll get this done early so you can focus on just being awesome. I appreciate that. Mm-hmm. So stay tuned for some future episodes that will feature some of the great interviews we had during LMT Lab Day Chicago. So we continue. (coughs) (laughs) I took a nap too, so. (laughs) Mm -hmm. You know, I'm a napper. I've always been a napper. Nappers, just I just love sleeping and curling up and going to bed. Sorry. If I could nap every day, I would. I love that. We have something else in common. That's a beautiful thing. Except my naps are like three hours. I wouldn't consider that a nap. I consider that like a short sleep. You know, one of the hardest things for me to do, like at six o'clock, you start thinking to yourself, it's too late for a nap. It's too early to go to bed. (laughs) What do I do? I'm so confused at this six to eight o'clock. It doesn't work. I know. I'm with you. I blame the dogs. They lay on me. They fall asleep. They make me tired. So we continue last week's roundtable discussion about 3D printing. Joining us again are Tony Prestopino, Michael Tanaka, Ken Kincaid, and Laura Sanders, Master Dental Technician. All right. So these technicians, we get more into a conversation about outsourcing to other labs, issues that they overcame, how printing affects their labor, and what's next for them. So sit down with us as we continue with four fantastic technicians talking about 3D printing. Just because Chicago Lab Day is over does not mean that the specials and celebration ends. Remember, it's their 75th anniversary all year long. Ask your NOAC Dental Supplies representative for current specials. And remember, they still stick to the same philosophy that Benny Nowak, founder of Nowak Dental Supplies, instilled. And that is to treat every single customer as they are our only customer. They believe in customer service and show this daily over the phone. Either Brandy or Sean Nowak are always in the office to assist you in any way you need. And I can totally say that that is the truth because Sean is always there when I call or text him. And he always helps and gives me whatever I need, which I appreciate. At Nowak Dental, you are more than a customer. You are part of our family. Give them a call at one 800 654 Seven six two three, or check out their website at noacdental.com. King Arthur had his knights, Captain America has his Avengers, and dentists have their laboratories. These unique individuals have gathered together to entertain and enlighten all who dare to sit down at the round table and listen to the voices from the bench. Tony, I'm not really familiar with exactly the way Carbon has things set up, but I've always looked at things in this manner. We've spent a lot of money too for our small laboratory. And if it comes back to where you're happy and you have more time and you can live a quality of life that you never did before, I think it's worth every penny. That's a great answer. That's the Tanky Dawson answer. That's right. I've been there too. <laughs> hey, Tony, with your with the carbon printer, something that I've found that's actually benefited us and made the carbon more profitable for us was that because of the speed and the accuracy at which we, can, we have with the carbon, right. um, that allowed us to do not just what we have in our lab, but then also to offer outsourcing to the smaller labs in our local area. 
So if you can come up with a competitive price and a faster turnaround time, you know, the more stuff that you print through that carbon via just models in its own right, it makes your printer excessively, makes your ROI come back a lot faster than anything. Well, Mike, that's an incredible point. That is exactly what I should do. Open it up to leather laboratories, you know, because it is a faster print. And, and, and since the learning curve is almost nothing and the, the nesting is almost nothing to do, and the cleaning doesn't take long enough, mm-hmm. I think that that could be a revenue builder. Great point, Mike. What's even even better is there are local labs, you know, that are already outsourcing to, let's say, you know, Henry Schein or Oregon or uh, Core 3D centers. Yep. You know, they already designed their models for you. So all you're really doing is just nesting and printing. Oh, man, let me tell you, it, it's a quick turnaround and easy. And if you can turn around to them in two days, yep. even if you're paying yep. to ship to them, you know, you're still going to make a little bit more money and you're still going to push more through, stuff through your carbon. So it just... Like I said, it makes it even easier. That's a great point. Is anybody else outsourcing to other labs with their printers? We we do here. We outsource. Uh, anybody who wants something um, done quickly and accurately, we go ahead and try to help them out as much as possible. But we don't have large accounts that do volume. Yeah. More for uh, closer colleagues in the industry who maybe run into a jam or something. I'm right there with Ken. That's that's what I do. I, I don't per se advertise that I can outsource that stuff because I keep my printers pretty busy with my work but if somebody were to contact me and need it then i would certainly help them out absolutely so how many of you guys outsourced and how long did you outsource before you ended up getting your first 3d printer we outsourced our partial frames and got products back that were so inconsistent and so such poor quality that it took about three months wow Uh, for me i think it was about maybe three or four years bouncing around between different printing centers uh just for models before we decided to take the leap to get our own printer just for models? Yeah, I mean, we're the same way. We were, we were outsourcing for three or four years. Finally found an option to get rid of the issue in the industry with machines breaking down and all these kind of stuff and the faster prints because I couldn't use a form lab and do the amount of volume that I have. So I, I got, now there was a printer on the market that gave me faster prints. I can do eight models in an hour and I have a machine that doesn't break down because if it does, it's monitored by carbon. Anytime they have a problem or if they think they're going to have an upcoming problem, they verify, they call me and say, look, we're going to have an upcoming problem tonight while you guys are home from work. We're going to adjust your machine, you know, via Silicon Valley somewhere in a, in a computer tech. You kind of, kind of like uh, take your car computer and, and you, you plug in your car at a, at a, at a gas station. Uh, the mechanic can diagnose what's the problem with your car, what might be coming a potential problem. Well, they do the same thing. And if they see a potential problem, they fix it. If the machine breaks and they can't fix it, they, I can send my models to them and get them right back to me until they get me a new machine. And they'll come and set it up. They'll make sure your computers are working, everything. And then, you know, like I said, they do all their software and everything. You don't, I don't, I virtually don't have to touch it unless I'm using it. Any problem, straight to them. It's not, I'm not calling like a cap who I bought a, a milling machine from, hey, I need some customer support. And then you call somebody and then they, <laughs> they have to ask you a bunch of questions to diagnose it. It's they diagnose it, they fix it, they clean it up, and I don't touch it. I walk away. All I have to do is order materials and run it. Well, you get what you pay for, right? <laughs> well, you get what you pay for large payment. It's the most expensive purchase any laboratory is probably going to do. And, it, and, it's, and mm-hmm. it's concerning, you know, because laboratories you know, in the industry today you know the laboratories are, what was there 15,000 laboratories 15,800 laboratories mm-hmm. six years ago right and everybody's joining the race to the bottom and you say oh you're gonna have a $2,500 a month payment or a $5,000 a month payment that's something that most of them can't afford of that big payment but for me I'm going if I'm gonna be one of those 6,000 laboratories that are still gonna be here in 10 years I need the best of the best so it wasn't about the money it's more more about the accuracy and the dependability. I have to agree with Tony. Uh, that's a big part of our business too, and it's con- making sure that we have the consistency and that quality. And being in North Dakota, you know, most of the world thinks that we're a little bit behind the times, and we like to think that we're ahead of times here in our laboratory, giving our dental clients the best of the best all the time. So, uh, you know, like Tony, making sure that we're still here in ten years and making sure we're giving our clients the best of the best. 
I think that's why we have to continue moving ahead and, uh, you know, embracing this digital world, this digital technology, whether, and it's going to be printing five years. I don't think it's going to be milling anymore. I think it will be printing. So it's going to be a very, very fun and exciting next uh, five to 10 years. How long did it take for you guys to get the consistency with the printers? Was it right out of the box or was there a lot of trial and error? on any of the machines yeah for me with the uh, carbon right out of the box everything was perfect the stratus the same thing um the Kara, depending upon which resins we're printing um most of them were pretty accurate um, but my personal opinion i mean the printer only prints what you tell it to sure so you're you know depending upon how easy or how whatever is it more so to me depends upon what you're designing and how it's designed versus which printer you're printing on. Uh-huh. You know, I mean, everything's STL based. So if you have a not very good design or if it's designed with some serious angles in it, obviously the printers can only print so much depending on if it's SLA or DLP. To me, in my personal opinion, I'd say it more so depends upon the designer over the printer that's printing. Interesting. I look at more of uh, it being the resins. I think I probably have 15 different resins here that I print. They don't all have the same curing times with the energy output of our printers. So there, there was a little bit of a, uh, it's not a challenge. It's just a little bit of a, a tactical uh, effort that we made to ensure that we're having the right amounts and the light cure time per layer for each of the materials that we've been working with. But once it's dialed in, I, I agree, it is more of the uh, designer error or any designer specifications that may cause problems with, with the print in the future. Do you find the same thing, Laura, since you're the only one doing it all? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I I agree with Ken totally. When when we first got the Verseo up and running, there was a little bit of a learning curve as far as nesting. You know, maybe I wasn't supporting it enough in one area, and I would get flat prints on half of my frame or something. But the Asiga, right out of the box, man, it it was easy. No problems whatsoever on it. Nice. But I, I did have a little bit of a learning curve with nesting correctly with my Versailles. Mm-hmm. What about downtime? You know, you always hear about people, if you buy one printer, you're going to need two. Do you find that true? Because most of you have multiple, except for Tony, who's only got that one, but it seems to have no problems whatsoever. Do you guys feel that you have downtime with these printers where there's errors or there's misprints or they're not working? I have not had any downtimes with either of my printers. I have two Varseos and I bought Mm -hmm. the second Varseo. I bought it used on eBay for a fraction of the original price. Really? And I bought it not because I was worried about my other one being down. I bought it because I wanted to be able to print more frames. Mm. But since buying any of these printers, none of them have been down or broken or anything like that. I'm I'm in the same boat as Laura. We've been very fortunate, but you know, the fact of the matter is printers do go down. Mm-hmm. I wouldn't say necessarily that you want to buy two right off the bat, but uh, I think it, when you get down and realize how much volume can actually produce and looking at the uh, the ROI and the return for your time and your family's times, it's not going to be a bad idea to have a second printer like Laura's doing and we're doing so you can do more volume and make your life a little bit easier when it comes to the weekends and evenings. I think a lot of it too, for us, at least in my lab, we don't necessarily have any printer downtime per se outside of uh, regular maintenance that we would do, i.e. cleaning and replacing parts that we feel are getting old or looking worn. But that also too, that is one of the great things about carbon is yes, it is a large investment, but in that same context, if you do have any downtime, your printer fails, you have issues, carbon is there to back you up, even to the point where 24 hours, they'll turn around, whatever you send them, they'll print it in-house and send it back to you. So, I mean, that's kind of one of the cool things. I mean, it's even to the point where we're looking at getting a second carbon installed because of that and pretty much shutting down the rest of our printers. We're having internal discussions on it because of that backing and tech support. And we have carbon in our back pocket, which right here in California, they're all six hours from us. That was one of the very, very attractive parts that carbon does offer to everybody. Um, that if you do invest in a carbon, if you have a problem, you can always send files to them. They will print them and get them back to you. So you have zero downtime, period. Yes. Tony and Michael, correct me if I'm wrong. The carbon printer, you can't actually buy that printer, right? You you lease it, right? Correct. It is uh, typically they are a three-year lease. And it's 50 grand a year, right? Uh, for the M2, yes. Okay. For the larger one of the two. Okay. Um, but then again, keep in mind too, I mean, as Tony specified before, 
Um, Carbon monitors that machine every single second of the day. And they also monitor what you are printing, how much you're printing. But that being said, to have a Carbon installed, they have an entire pre-installation checklist and team, even to the point where they check your internet speed. If your internet speed and internet connection isn't what they deem viable, they will not install the printer until everything is to their specifications. Right. It, it does it does get testy at times. And those those carbon printers, they are huge high volume output printers. They're not, you know, just little printers. Industry, they're huge. And they get they have other printers for air and air and space and you know, Adidas tennis shoes and things like that. But in the dental space, what would take me eight hours with a form lab, I can do in one hour with a carbon. Right. Now now Another thing about the carbon and the lease and the money and everything, think about all the machines we bought over the years as technicians. You know, you got your wall ceram and your, you know, all these old machines. They're not, you know, Piccolo's and, and Forte's and things like that. They're not worth anything after three to five years getting them. So it's not like you're leasing something that you can actually sell in the end. Is it true you got to wear the white hazmat suit when you use it? Because it seems like I see a picture with everybody wearing those suits. <laughs> Only if Carbon's in the house. If no oh, one okay. Carbon is there, you know. <laughs> no, okay. I'm just, just making sure. <laughs> and then you always have to have your picture standing next to it so they can show you how <laughs> big the machine is. Too. Very true. Very true. <laughs> when they first came out, they had rompers. Everybody. Yes. <laughs> So I know we talked about getting it into the workflow, but have you been able to find that you're able to lessen your employees because of 3D printing? Are you saving money in labor? No, I won't. I'm not going to fall into the, because I know a lot of companies would like to think this. Hey, you buy these machines. I'm proud and I want a way to feed all of these people. I want them to have dinner on the table. I want them to buy homes and get married and have children. I don't want to uh, get rid of some employees because I have some fancy machines. My business plan would rather get more work than to let someone go. Absolutely. Well, when it comes to my strategy here, too, it's the same thing. We're not getting rid of employees. There's only five of us here. And with the age of our other two employees, besides my, my brothers, we have to embrace this technology because we can't find quality technicians that want to come to North Dakota. <laughs> so we have an, an issue that we have to deal with. And we're going to hope that this digital technology is going to help uh, help save what we're doing so we can continue doing the volume that we're doing and continue doing the products and the quality that we're doing for our clients. It's, it's just going to be a different way of doing things. Uh, so yeah, I, we're not getting rid of employees. We just can't find them. Mm -hmm. Right. I don't think you actually replace employees, period. I mean, even if you were to let an employee go, you're replacing them with a machine, which still is going to cost you the same amount of money, if not more. Um, I think Tony is on the right decision, as well as Ken, that it's not so much that you're going to make anything, uh, a machine replace a person. And it certainly doesn't necessarily change your payroll, but what the machines do allow you to do is up your volume by a massive amount that, to be honest, humans just can't get done. Sure. So for me, I, you know, we just have the two employees. I didn't have anybody to let go. But when I first got into doing RPDs, I only had about a week and a half worth of training. And so it was all very new to me. I spent a week with Jeremiah Noss learning the analog side of RPDs and I was slow like it took me three hours to wax a frame mm -hmm. so by getting these printers and learning to design them digitally it sped my process up tenfold and then being able to let the printers print all night it's like having an employee that works 24 hours a day for you but you're not having to pay them overtime. Sure. That's a great point. Yep, agreed. Yeah. So all you guys are printing overnight, obviously. Yeah, absolutely. Yes. So what's the next step? What are you guys looking to do? Are you looking to stop milling altogether? What's the next step after this? We're going to always mill, and we're going to always print, and there is going to be some things that are always handmade. It's an industry where 15 years from now, like I think it was Ken who said, you know, it's hard to find technicians. Mm -hmm. The lost wax technique and things like that will become obsolete. And I think we'll always layer porcelain on a coping, whether it's a Zirconia coping or not. Uh, I think in the next, like, five to ten years, the digital industry is mostly restricted by resins. So as companies spend more in research and development onto resins, 
depending upon what those resins can do and what we as a lab can do, printing those resins is going to drive more so than anything. Mm -hmm. But I personally think that in the next few years, what you're going to actually see is a big divide between economy versus craft. So I'm sure we all have those GPs that want the lowest price possible. And we all have the GPs that say, whatever it costs, it costs. I just want the product the way I want it. Mm -hmm. So your hand layered portions aren't going to go anywhere. Milling's not going to go anywhere. But what I think the advancement will come will be with printing teeth. So whether it's a dental material or whatever resin's coming up next, you know, all of us that are already printing, we have that opportunity to be able to print a tooth on a die or on an abutment as an economy. You know, it can very quickly replace, already is probably replacing PMMA. Mm -hmm. So instead of running a mill and milling a PMMA temporary crown, now we can print it. It takes less time and costs less money. It absolutely gives us all the opportunity to open up to the economy line versus trying to stay the standard of, you know, our Highline crowns and Premier crowns. Interesting. What about you, Ken? Where are you going? I'm going to go as far as the industry is going to allow us to go. I know a lot of the things Michael mentioned with resins, the FDA has got their hands in just about everything right now. The companies are, I believe, working on things to try to get things better, to make them more long-term, to make them more highly aesthetic. But it, it takes time and it takes them a lot of money to come up with these different uh, products that we as lab owners can print. But I think it will get there. As soon as it does, I'll be jumping on full board. Uh, everything will be digital. I would say within five years, we will have everything digital here in our little lab. It's, it's wonderful. I come to work. I'm happy. I leave work 12 hours later. I'm still happy because I'm trying new things. I'm working with these new materials and uh, staying ahead of the curve. Not everybody can say that. Uh, so our family is really proud of what we've done here. That's fantastic. So have you guys been able to lower prices on your items that you used to do traditional that you now 3D print? Or have you had to increase the prices to cover the cost of the 3D printers? How has that worked out? And you don't need to get into cost specifics because that's not what we're about. Elvis, I'm going to jump all over this one. Go for it. <laughs> I am not going to race to the bottom. In fact, I'm going to race to the top as quickly as possible, and I'm going to try to find the highest mountain that it can be uh, because I believe we are on the cutting edge, uh, just like everybody else that's on this phone call. Mm -hmm. We are cutting edge. We should not be looked down upon. We should not be seen as people who aren't worth what they are. We as technicians who are putting all the time and putting in all the effort, putting the money into these machines, putting our, our knowledge to the test on a daily basis, we are highly qualified, highly skilled people in this economy that we're living in. So when it comes to these things, we are actually going up in price. We have gone up in price and we're going to continue to as long as we are here and what we are able to get our continued education and we're keeping up with technology and we're moving forward at a rate that is almost unsurpassed by any other industry, we have to keep our prices up. We have to charge a premium because gosh darn it, you guys, we are worth it. I agree. I agree. Fist bump. The only thing for me is um, where I'm at in the LA area, you know, we have a ton of labs around here. So unfortunately, the race to the top, I like Ken's idea and I think he's going the right direction. Fortunately for me, that's just not what we can do. Yep. Uh, mm -hmm. So we try to keep our prices the same, and the way we make more money is just more volume. Mm. Right. Michael, I'm in D.C. There's a lot of labs. I'm not joining the race to the bottom. I've decided to do everything with top materials, top equipment, top machinery. All of my implant reps, my dental supply vendors know that I will only use authentic materials and parts and pieces. And that's how I do the volume because if you want a laboratory, if you want to ensure to a dentist or a client that they're going to get, stuff and the best stuff then here's a laboratory if you're looking to go to join the race to the bottom here's a laboratory but they're not the same so they i get referrals way to try to keep growing mike and i i believe when you say there's a race to the bottom going in la crowns are coming out doctors want 60 million dollar crowns and stuff and i get that but i'm not that guy even though i'm in that district where there's a lot of laboratories for the lowest price tony account I hear you, Tony. I'm not. I'm not saying I'm in the race to the bottom. I'm trying to keep my prices static. I'm not going down in price, not at all. Um, I just try to keep everything static as what I can do. Um, that still makes me profitable. And like I said, I how I didn't have the choice, so I had to open up to try and get more volume um, to stay competitive, so I can keep that price the same and not have to drop my price. Oh, Mike, I agree with you. I understand. 
I'm just trying to tell you, I know your plight and it's difficult. And by the way, I respect you, brother. I've known you for years. I've never oh, yeah. met you person, but I, your name precedes yourself. <laughs> Thank you, sir. <laughs> I call it the race to compete. Yeah. <laughs> yep, that is true. You have to sacrifice somewhere, and hopefully it's not price. So. Yeah, I agree with Tony 100%. I keep all of the best materials that I can get, and I didn't let the fact that I was digital and that I was printing create a low price point for me. I set my prices where I wanted them, and I make the best out of the best. Well, Laura, I know that people that hand wax frameworks are very hard to come by. Yes, they are. Yes. When you went from traditional frameworks that were hand wax to printed frameworks, you did not change price? I learned RPDs in a very short time. I wasn't doing RPDs when I was in-house. Oh, okay. So I didn't learn to do those until we opened the lab. And I literally had a crash course from Bego when I bought my machines. Uh huh. Martin Schmidt, he actually said, you know, you need to know how to do the analog side because these machines will go down eventually and you need to be able to still make frames. Sure. And so I said, I agree with that completely. So I, I had a three-day crash course with Martin Schmidt and then um, I knew it wasn't enough. So I had recently attended a course in Jeremiah's lab. And so I messaged him on Facebook, like, hey, can you teach me how to make RPD frames? And he was more than willing to let me come to his lab and spend a week with him. And he taught me everything about making RPD frames. So I did have to make frames for probably about a three-month period before we were able to set up the curve. Mm -hmm. But I knew that I was going to be printing eventually. So I just kind of set my price point right there. I didn't I didn't go up or down from when I was making them analog. Interesting. Well, we're wrapping up here on an hour, everybody. Does anybody have anything you want to add? Anything you want to say about 3D printing? Here's your chance to tell the world. Well, I, I tell you, it, it's been a privilege listening to the, to the roundtable attendees on this. And uh, again, my opinion is... You probably have found out technology is the way to go. I hope everybody who listens to this uh, podcast understands that you need to look into this because there's going to be a time when there isn't going to be anything else but digital technology. 3D printing is a wonderful way to get into it. There's tons of options out there. Uh, you don't always have to spend uh, the most to get the best, but it does help. Mm -hmm. And I'm looking forward to everything that's coming up in the future with this. And uh, I'm going to embrace it. And I hope everybody else does too. Are you going to get a carbon can? Um, I have a hard time with what we make per year, justifying the 30 grand or 25 grand or whatever sure. it is per year for the yeah. lease. We bought our printers for, for that amount. So I, I guess it's going to be kind of hard to do that. If I buy a new printer every three years, I still come out ahead. And as long as I'm happy with sure. the results that I'm getting, I think I'm just going to continue going that route. But I'm not going to say it's uh, off the table. What printer would you recommend to somebody wanting to get into it? For the price, I really like the MeCraft. It's got a large build plate. It's it's printing fairly quickly. Mm -hmm. And the accuracy, with uh, depending on the resins that you're using, it, it's phenomenal. For somebody who wants to do a little bit more volume, definitely go with the Diplo. The Accurate Diplo that we've got. Two build trays on there. We're doing probably 10, 12 models in an hour. Really can't complain with it. Partial frameworks are very quick in there, about 35 minutes. So, yeah, that's our that's our go-to when we're ever getting a, in a time jam. But, again, that one's going to cost a little bit more, too. Sure. And I'm going to try to have links for all of these systems that you guys have on the show notes. So when this eventually airs, people will be able to click to them and learn more about them. Hmm, that'd oh, be sure. pretty cool. Yeah. Yeah. So what about you, Michael? I must say it's hard to beat the carbon but you know the price tag and the lease that it comes with is very difficult not everybody can really go with that mm -hmm. my suggestion is if you want to try to see what it's about you know call a lab that has a carbon see if they can test it see what they'll do for you you know other than that i don't know much about the segas i don't know much about the diplos but the stratuses are pretty good you know each i believe each of our sale i've messed with a little bit um i can't say that i'm a excessively proficient with it but um, I have seen prints that come very good from them. So I think it's kind of, it's niche. Whatever works for your lab would probably be best. Me personally, like I said, my choice would always be a carbon just because of the technology that it comes with. And if this is the direction that we're all planning to go in the future, 
you know, it's kind of hard to pass up on what they offer and what's behind it. It's just a very large nut to swallow to in the initial. Mm-hmm. Yep. Mm. And Laura, what about you? Where would you start? Well, for me, for the volume that I do, the the printers that I have, you know, they complement each other great. The Sega makes up for the Varseo's downfalls and vice versa. Mm-hmm. I, I wouldn't mind having a, a second of Sega just to have it, but I don't really need it. I don't think I'll ever invest in, in the big carbon printer because I just don't do that kind of volume. And I don't know that I ever would, but I am watching the digital denture trends very, very closely. Yeah. And and we'll just see where they go. And that will kind of see, you know, that'll kind of dictate where I go. It'll be interesting to see what people have at Lab Day in 2019. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, I think it's going to be, it's probably going to be the biggest thing there. I imagine. Oh, yes. I appreciate it, everybody. I thought that was great. I learned a lot. I mean, I, there's a lot I didn't know about some of the printers that you guys have and uh, and how to implement it into a workflow. I, I appreciate your time. Thank you so much. Oh, well, thank it's you. It's an honor. Sure. Thank you. Thank you very much. It was awesome. Hey, I was thank you, buddy. It was my honor to be here. I look at the things that the NADL does, and Voices from the Bench is a new part of that, and I follow it on social media. I think it's uh, incredible what you're doing with it. I'm glad to be a part of it. And I hope to do more with you, but it's always my honor. And I hope all of you have a happy holiday. I appreciate it. And we'll talk to you guys soon. All right. Thank you, Elvis. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. You guys all have a wonderful weekend. You too. You all too. You too. We can't thank enough Laura, Ken, Michael, and Tony for taking time out of their busy schedule to talk to us about how and why they 3D print. If you're interested in what printer they're using or you want to get in contact with any of the guests, head over to this episode's show notes at VoicesFromTheBench.com to learn more. Now, we love to put together roundtables, and we want to put together more roundtable episodes. If you have a good idea and know some guests that would be good to have on to talk about it, send us an email at info at VoicesFromTheBench.com, and we can see if we can put a roundtable together. We love our roundtables. It's really cool to have four different voices or three different voices and three different opinions, and it's not the easiest thing to do, but please get in touch with us. Let's do it. Yeah, everybody's schedule is pretty busy. It's hard to get everyone lined up, but when it does, it's always a fantastic conversation. Yep, and you're my hero because you're the organizer, so kudos to you. (laughs) Are you feeling the love coming from me today or what? I do feel the love. I do. I'm appreciating that. (laughs) Thank you. Because when I told my wife I need to run to the lab to record, she said, Christ, was the text. (laughs) We're going to have to bleep you out. Damn, you're in trouble. Even though LMT Lab Day was just last weekend, join us next week as we have the interviews we did from January's Vision 21 meeting. It was a great meeting with a fantastic vibe, so don't miss next week. All right, everybody. Have a good one. Bye. 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 smarter than I look.